there, welcome back to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and my internet studio guest is Eric Fleischman today. And welcome, Eric. Hi. It's so good to be here. <laughs> it's very good to have you. I'm going to read your little bio now. Um, okay. Eric is an anarchist indebted to communistic and continental thought, but engaged primarily in traditions of mutualism, which is... North American individualist anarchism and modern left libertarianism while applying a background in anthropology and philosophy to helping build the solidarity economy in unceded Wabanaki territory on Turtle Island. There's a lot of things in there I could ask you about already that I <laughs> know a little but not nearly enough about. But um, can we start with you and kind of how you describe your politics if somebody asked you and if there was any journey to get there. Yeah. Um, I think I respond differently as to what my politics is, depending on the context, not like in like, I disguise my politics in any way, but like if I'm in a more libertarian crowd, I'll be like a left libertarian or a left-wing market anarchist. Whereas if I'm more working with like socialists and communists and stuff, I'm a libertarian socialist or a libertarian market socialist or you know, all things that I think aptly describe what my politics is, but, you know, sort of the, the, the aesthetic is slightly different and can be more palatable to some people in certain ways. Um, that makes lots of sense to me. <laughs> um, as for my political journey, um, I'm originally from the Midwest, um, not very far from where some of Josiah Warren's uh, experimental communities were. And so I grew up sort of hearing a little bit about those things. Um, but large majority of my time there, I was very much a bleeding heart libertarian, philosophical anarchist. So concerned with individual liberty, but still like not fully willing to give up the idea of the state and like as a as a component of equality and welfare. But then in, um, in high school, I read Emma Goldman's Anarchism and Other Essays, Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty and Markets Not Capitalism from C4SS and Autonomy Media. And I mean, that kind of just changed my that shifted my whole worldview and sort of solidified the idea for me that like individual liberty is not something that needs to be balanced with equality. Um, but is it's really through freedom and mutual cooperation in the absence of violence that equity, equality, fraternity, liberty can be achieved. Um, this sort of launched me very much into kind of a, a historical journey, um, of these sort of positions, like um, for the Perdonists, the North American Individualist Anarchists and Mutualists, the Libertarian New Left Alliance in the 1960s and 70s, modern left-wing market anarchism, especially as articulated by Kevin Carson, who's been a huge influence on me. Um, around that same time, I was introduced to Chris Matthew Scabara um, and his School of Dialectical Libertarianism, which is about uh, basically pursuing liberty and autonomy um, through the art of context keeping, of, of using what is available in the context as opposed to abstractions, more or less. There's more de deeper than that, but... Um, I feel like I almost understand what that could mean, but that's... No, yeah, we can delve into it. Um, I'm happy to, but the, the matter of dialectics is what sort of drew, and an interest in continental philosophy. I have a little bit of background in philosophy and the academic sphere, and that turned me towards... Uh, Marxists and Marxian thinkers um, like Marx, uh, but also Gramsci, Bukharin, Wolf, Luxembourg, uh, the autonomists like Antonio Negri and Silvia Federici. Um, I mean, I love the Black Panther Party and Huey Newton and that sort of on the ground Marxist politics. Um, and so I integrated a lot of that analysis into my um, freed market uh, individualist anti-capitalist politics. I don't know. I'm I'm always curious about somebody who has a soft spot for Marx when they're not a Marxist. Um, I saw an interview with the libertarian economist Deirdre McCloskey once where she said that Marx was the greatest social scientist of the 19th century and he got almost everything wrong, which is very intriguing to me, but though I don't fully understand it. Um, but... I mean, like, what about, like, what's, you know, what can you get anarchist wise out of Marx? Like, tell um, me about Marx. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what can we get out of Marx? Um, 
I think it's two things. It's interesting models of analysis and um, potential allies. Um, uh, I think it's also important to talk about the fact that there's like, there's a, there's a million Marxes and there's a million Marxisms. And, um, you know, when we talk about Marxism, especially as anarchists, we tend to lean towards thinking of Marxist Leninists. Um, but in reality, uh, that's like a, even if it does play, it's probably the loudest segment of Marxists. But if we went around judging groups by their loudest members, it would probably, everyone would look pretty bad. Um, I think the nothing thing else, Marx was just a writer, right? So I always thought, you know, uh, comparing him, like right wing people love to throw him in with Lenin and Stalin sometimes even as if he had any, you know, because he wrote some stuff down somehow he was responsible for a dictatorship decades later. I mean, yeah, it's obviously and I, a difference there. Yeah, and I mean, I, the similar case could be made against John Locke and like his arguments around labor being uh, mixing labor being a basis for uh, indigenous genocide because apparently according to the sort of eurocentric views on property indigenous people didn't have quote unquote property and so it was sort of That's a, a really good point <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just think that laying I, and this isn't even to deny that marx was kind of a dick and like was <laughs> not a, a very nice person and if i were alive in the time of marx i would obviously side with Bakunin and the, and the Jura Federation and the, and folks like that. But at the same time, like we're not in that era. We're in a very different era. We're in the era where all of the state communist projects, except for like maybe Cuba have collapsed or become part of authoritarian capitalist hegemony. And now we need to be like, Oh crap. None of these projects have worked so far on the basis of not simply on the basis of Marx, but on the basis of like Leninism and Stalinism and Juche and Maoism, even though Maoism as a philosophy emerges mostly in Latin America as a, as a coherent philosophy, but still it's, it's, you know, I think we're in a totally different situation and we're facing a lot of really um, complex and dangerous um, issues right now, whether it's, you know, I mean, where do you even want to start? The uh, global warming, the which is basically the world's slowest atomic bomb, the uh, uh, it, like constant um, business cycle, you know, booms and busts. We just had the Silicon Valley bank collapse, and you, literally in, in, in next month, um, the U.S. government is supposed to default on its debt, and and like it could have like huge ramifications. And so, in the face of these sort of like impending problems that aren't going to be some like one big break like the the apocalypse it's going to be these rolling problems that increase and increase and increase that we've even we're, we're in the middle of uh with the pandemic and and you know um property concentration and wealth inequality i think with all these face, things facing even if mass isn't like the number one thing you need to enforce change it's we need a network as widely as possible and we need to work with the circumstances we're at and marxists have a lot of good stuff to say about the problems that we were we're looking at right now and are there's plenty of marxists out there who i would love to work with and who and marxists i do work with and feel like i i am very much even if we have these sort of like long term methodological differences we're both working for like autonomy now and worker power now, and, you know, not being effed over by the capitalist state now. That's what I mean by potential allies. But the th way I sort of have approached it is to sort of try to cross-pollinate analyses. So that means looking at things like historical materialism, which is one of the things that I am a little bit known for amongst market anarchists, is the fact that I have a lot of good things to say about historical materialism. And I think that's sort of like a beginning of maybe like coming to common terms about what the problems we're facing are. Um, we can definitely segue into historical materialism. I also am always sort of turned off the way it's spoken about by some Marxist as if it's sort of a hard science. Like yeah. we all know it's this and then this and then this as every single time, just like, you know, and it, it's very, it's not very like, Oh, well tell me more about how this analysis can be used 
you know, in today's world, it's just like, it goes like this and this and this. Um, yeah. So I'm a little at a loss there, but um, historical materialism. Tell me about that. Well, first I want to say I would, I think that Marx in and of his own writing is like hit or miss. And, but okay. if you really want like a good, like, here's how to use Marxist analysis on the ground. It's anything written by Huey Newton of the Black Panther Party okay. or particularly mm-hmm. the new Huey P. Newton reader because it very much draws on like the Marxist analysis but is more like, okay, let's stop talking abstraction and let's talk about like what are the on-the-ground problems? How does Marx help us in this thing? Um, That's interesting. I wouldn't have going to write that down. <laughs> Um, but so as for with old Huey. oh yeah, um, as for historical materialism, um, it's the the complaint that you you level at that it's very much like here's the absolute science of history and society, very fair, especially the forms that were taken like under the Soviet Union and and under um, Stalin and Lenin, where it really became like a state ideology, which is you mm-hmm. know. Um, even if Marx had some authoritarian tendencies, I think it's very much a bastardization of his original ideas um, because it's a model. It's it's not absolute truth. It's not absolute science. It's a model. And we live in a universe and a world that is terrifyingly complex and on all scales, whether it's human, whether it's cosmic, whether it's quantum physics, it's just this overwhelming sense of chaos. And historical materialism or any other model can provide us a way to make sense of that chaos. In particular, historical materialism is a model uh, of society produced by applying the philosophy of dialectical materialism. Um, Dialectical materialism is a philosophy outlined by Marx, but made more canon by Engels, but I think it's more important to look at what Marx said, that basically holds that When we look at the world at first glance, we see units or objects that seem to mostly just be interacting on a superficial level, like say things bumping into each other or things eating each other, or they're still like units unto themselves. But in reality, the world is made up of interconnected material processes. So we only get this like in the moment glance at what the world is. And we don't see that, like, if you took it from a fourth dimensional view with time as, like, a spatial element, you would get these, like, long processes that are that are interconnecting with each other. And, you know, even think about, like, species as processes that are, that are constantly changing and morphing and interacting with their environments. Right. And more than just interconnected material processes, they're processes that both mutually constitute and then sometimes contradict each other. So things will, you know come into conflict and then through that conflict new and um new new things come into existence through that conflict and the mediation of that conflict that's really abstract so right i'll say we got we got to get a little less abstract than that give me some material (laughs) examples yes when you take that to say a social um you know a a society-wide view the main way in which material processes are, you know, uh, controlled or utilized is through economic production and economic distribution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, a great way to think about it is um, how, how did you get what's around you? You know, if you think about like the room you're in currently, um, the context from which you're drawing empirical information and is is primarily was created by economic or if entirely created by economic production, that the dis- the decision making around what went where and for what price and for what um, you know uh, any other uh, um, milieu of of economic factors are the core parts of how you get the environment around you, especially under capitalism, where you know things are are increasingly um, produced for the, the the purpose of being commodities on the market. I'm not against commodities. I don't fully buy into the Marxist analysis of commodities, but it is an excellent point. And so, you know, the main way, and if the main way that material processes are wielded um, to create our context is through economic production, 
then the system of ownership of that production and distribution, aka a class system, you know, who works, mm-hmm. who owns, is the, are the main social forces that are contradicting but mutually constituting each other. So here's a, a concrete example is um, owners of capital and wage laborers. Oh, uh, They seem to be, you know, two separate things. There's the people working and there's the people owning. But in reality, it's this constant conflict over um, who has control over the situation. And not just that, but the owners of capital can't exist without la- wage laborers to work that capital. And wage laborers can't exist without the owners of capital. And so, and then ultimately in the in that conflict between the owners of capital and wage laborers, it's in the dignity of labor and the power of labor that that contradiction is overcome and workers or producers become, you know, get greater power in society. Greater power is good um, for them, certainly, but I guess I wouldn't have described that as a contradiction so much as ideally a mutually beneficial situation. I mean, obviously you have plenty of horrible working conditions, horrible bosses, Mm -hmm. but in theory they need each other. So yay, question mark. I mean, if they need each other, then surely it's it's, um, in their best interest to reach uh, an equilibrium of some kind. Yeah, and and that's sort of the model of social cooperation, which dominates most like liberal economies, if you can even call mm-hmm. what it's now a liberal economy. That oh, classes should work together because yeah, labor wage labor wage laborers can't exist without capital. But I think what it it's more it's less about oh these people can't exist without each other, and more that these categories can't exist without each other. That historically the way that a class of people who owns capital most investable wealth large amounts of the means of production um is by disenfranchising large segments of the population whether it's through the enclosure of the commons in england or it's the um or it's colonialism in america or and these are more historical but we can even talk about like there's this term in Marxism called primitive accumulation. It's all the violence that had to be put together before the market came in and pretends to be this nonviolent thing, even if you can call what we have a market. But primitive accumulation is still going on today. Uh, you can just start, call it state capitalism. It's, uh, you know, whether it's I'm uh, uh, corporate subsidies or uh, fiat property or the the monopolies of land and banking and um, and uh, transportation that w- there's this constant element of violence continually aiding people who own large amounts of capital and disenfranchising people who um, do not so that they can continue to be working those wage labor hours for pe- large scale owners of uh, property. Tell me about markets. I mean, do you try to sell markets to Marxists? Like, what do you think they do for people? What would they even sort of look like in a non, you know, in our magical non-coercive anarchist world? I mean, some people, you know, plenty of anarchists, most that I've encountered are not fond of the concept. Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with the way markets have been very effectively rebranded by the by capitalism, the capitalist class, capitalist think tanks, capitalist authors. Um, the I, especially. Hmm, let me think about it real quick, um, because the. You know, if you look at the, especially, and we can get into this later about Lawrence Labadie, is that you see that in the you know 1700s, the 1800s, the sort of free market argument is not coming from people who are like, "Wow, I love big business and I love these, um, you know, uh, these sort of exploitative wage labor relationships," but are coming from people who, you know, basically identified as socialists, uh, David Ricardo and Thomas Hodgkin, and even to a certain degree. Um, Adam Smith, although he didn't use the term socialist. And then that sort of uh, philosophy gets it's, um, adopted very much by like Proudhon and the sort of free market thinkers and Benjamin Tucker and all that. And then around the 20th century, um, it there was this 
huge rebrand um, that you can only, as I'm going through the Lawrence Labati archives, I'm seeing this rebrand. I'm seeing Labati being like, wait, when did we start agreeing that free markets led to corporatism or that like, um, that, you know, these, these exploitative relationships are engendered by markets and more and more the sort of rhetoric of free markets has been used by, you know, cons conservatives and, and far right people to talk about stuff that isn't really a free market all market at all. It's just a kind of market. Um, but I think the, the, hmm, the way that I would put it is that a market context without state violence is radically different than what a market system um, under capitalism is because the the markets uh, under <sighs> let me think about this <laughs> um, markets right now exist. There's obviously commodity exchange going on, but because of these things we talked about like monopolism and and you know the constant primitive accumulation kind of violence um that favors particular actors in the market it's easy it's it's pretty much um easy to say that m markets the means of distribution are captured and they're trained to produce particular technologies for particular reasons especially in the interests of the welfare warfare state so like mm -hmm. To talk about a free market economy now with, um, you know, the way that like even the most basic infrastructure of how we get products from point A to point B is totally engendered by taxation and regulation and infrastructure and, um, you know, legibility projects by like uh, the state to like make sure that you can't do anything without them knowing about it. Um, and then on top of that, the fact that prison labor plays such a huge role in in our system to draw market wages down or the ways that markets are used to produce weapons of warfare the it's just it's 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 strange that we get into this idea of markets being this when markets are really just people trading it's you know it's a way to negotiate scarcity without resorting to violence and i have a lot of speculations no continue I oh, just, but it, I guess to me, it's this is this may sound very basic, but when talking to people who are farther left than I am, whatever that means, try to tell them, you know, that a market dynamic is important, and that people, you know, in say America, people the world over have, you know, are better off than they were in. 1405 and why is that you know and does have do markets have nothing to do with it the fact that we're not all scrounging for everything anymore um but at the same time you have to argue that um there are five trillion restrictions and special interests and monopolies sure so i don't know i guess rhetorically it's even hard to untangle as it is in real life yeah, it totally is. And the funny thing is, is that in my experience, most socialists that aren't Marxist-Leninists are actually okay with market exchange. They just don't want to call it that. That Oh, really? I mean, at least in my experience, like uh, I, the socialists that I work, they love farmers markets. They love, you know, barter. They love just like mm -hmm. people producing on the on land that they own collectively and sharing and trading and these are market dynamics like even if they don't involve money if you're using like your um any kind of pricing whether whether it's direct exchange by like i'll give you 10 potatoes for 10 uh pieces of celery that's a market dynamic that's and 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 i i struggle to find socialists who aren't author who aren't like outright authoritarians who are against that and mm. Even more so, I'm seeing an increasing trend among young socialists and even communists away from like socialism as a specific objection to market exchange and commodities, especially you know in light of the, the the calculation debates and the failure of the Soviet Union and stuff, and and more a concern about the everyday dynamics of wage labor and other extractive relationships like rent and things engendered by property that's enforced by the state. And then also just like a very 
understandable concern with the fact that there's a small group of people who own the means of production and investable wealth and are able to utilize state control to to control the rest of our lives. Um, and, and I think that's really the sort of the new, new left that I'm seeing, especially people 18 to 25, is so much less of this like outright dogma and more of just like, holy shit, we live in a deeply um, violent and unequal society. And what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do? Um, I think I missed the road off to uh, to segue into your anarcho capitalist uh, anarcho capitalism essay that you had um, back in May 2022 about whether anarcho capitalism is anarchism at all. Mm-hmm. And I used to use the that forbidden term. And shout out to Christopher Cantwell, actual Nazi, for making me fully discard it because. Wow. Um, But, you know, you're talking about um, a stateless market and it both sounds good in a real way and sounds like, you know, the way a savvier ANCAP would try to sell anarcho-capitalism. So, in short, let's talk about is anarcho-capitalism anarchism? Yeah, I got a lot. And your essays, particularly, if you have a... Yeah, I got a lot of flack for this on Twitter. Um... (laughs) <laughs> which is one of those days that I'm really glad that I don't actually have a Twitter. Um, Fair enough. But yeah. Um, so I guess first my, my point is that like, I'm not saying that we shouldn't work with anarcho-capitalists or radical libertarians or other than, and, and, or even that they don't have sol- solid ideas. I, I think Robert Murphy, Murphy's chaos theory David Friedman's um, Machinery of Freedom, Rothbard's For a New Liberty should be like required reading because it's really Hi. good work on the way that market dynamics can, um, you know, in take the role that, you know, state institutions now take. But hmm. the piece in particular, the, the, the age old question is anarcho-capitalism, anarchism is kind of two interrelated points. The first is this, that I think libertarianism and anarchism are just simply different things. Um, and anarcho-capitalism is an extension of libertarianism. So libertarianism, a term that actually has a left-wing connotation historically, but was uh, right, right. You know, adopted in the 20th century by you know um, people who would originally call themselves liberals, and but had felt that the term liberal had been co-opted. So they were like, oh, we'll just take it right. back. Um, but so you stole uh, liberal- our word, we'll steal yours. Exactly. You know, it's just a vicious cycle. But you know, liberalism is a view that emerged in the eighteenth century that saw the breakdown of absolute monarchism and advancing industrialism as like a positive impact, um, by which markets could be expanded and you know, civil society and trade could be the means by which we negotiate with each other, and that intervention from government could be reduced as much as possible. Because this is coming out of mercantilism and monarchism and all these different things like that. So liberalism at its core is expanded markets, reduced government. Um, in contrast, I think anarchism is is not just simply the getting rid of the state, at least as a coherent ideology that emerged in around the same time as liberalism, as opposed to sort of like anarchistic tendencies in stateless societies all across the world that took on the problem not just of monarchy and traditionalism and state intervention, but also came to critique the new hierarchies emerging in early industrial capitalism. That it was on a whole less concerned with a straightforward, let's expand the market and let's reduce the state and was more a complex critique of violence and hierarchy, um, which included state over society, but also men over women, adults over children, bosses over workers, humans over nature. And that's really how it's enacted in anarchist in like modern anarchist discourses is, is is a question of like w- pretty much like what's the most hierarchy we can get rid of like that's the debate between vegan anarchists and non-vegan anarchists is like it can how far can we go in 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 getting rid of the hierarchy between humans and animals and and so in that that's sense <laughs> yeah, isn't it i i still haven't gotten quite around to that but but in the in this sense some anarchists are libertarians I'm a libertarian anarchist. I want an expansion mm-hmm. in the market, and I want a complete reduction of government. But 
as a part of a strategy to challenge hierarchy both from the state and within civil society itself. And that's sort of the way that I think that left libertarians and neo-mutualists and left-wing market anarchists today identify as both anarchists and libertarians because they're different traditions. And I even think that you know, 19th century individualist anarchists like Benjamin Tucker and, and folks like, you know, Dyer Lum and Lysander Spooner were proto-libertarians in many ways because they, they totally wanted an expansion of the market and a, you know, um, a reduction of the state. But I think that reducing them to just that and then saying, oh, well, anar anarcho-capitalism does the same thing is sort of like a weird way to draw yourself into to, to a tradition that has like a long and storied history. There's a second part to that, that I'm not just making a historical claim, but I'm making like a strategic claim because, you know, I, I argue for allying with Marxists and other socialists, particularly to put the hands, put the means of production into the hands of workers. Um, but I'm not under any illusion that they're anarchists. And in the same way that like, I'm totally down to work with anarcho capitalists, but they lack a more fine-grained critique of hierarchy. Like a great way to look at it I is sure do. how do they, how do the, my like litmus test is what is your view of the factory? If you want to take over mm -hmm. the factory and make it democratic, you might be an anarchist. If you want to destroy the factory, you might be an anarchist. If you want the factory to remain exactly the same, except without like the minimal labor laws that currently exist, you're probably not an anarchist. Like it just, it, none it, of the above. Is that allowed? You're, it can be none of the, you know, it's like it, it, <laughs> also another, none of the above. But even so, like if, you're, if your view is that like, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with the way the factories exist other than state intervention, I think there's something wrong with that. But even more dangerously, I think the fact that they don't have this fine-grained critique of hierarchy, it leaves them wide open for ter like elements of fascism, white nationalism, even like somehow monarchism, like integrating. Boy, does it. <laughs> I mean, like it really, it's, it's kind of off the rails. Like, and <sighs> so many groups mm -hmm. like Hoppe and the Mises Caucus and, and um, the Mises Institute and Christopher Cantwell and Liberty Hangout, like are just being overrun by the, by like far right people. And, and even the people who aren't, you know, you know, super racist, evil people don't have a genuine critique of like that kind of ideology beyond, oh, well, it just shouldn't be enforced by the state. Um, and I just don't think that's enough. I don't think that's enough to be an anarchist. Some of those people blessedly have stopped using words that we might like, like libertarian and anarchist and have moved on to some more honest words, you know? Last yeah. I checked on Cantwell, I think he was using white nationalist or something much more fitting. So thanks for that, at least. Yeah, um, no, totally. And I mean, I think you're seeing that. There was this whole thing with like r slash anarcho-capitalism on Reddit that was basically... Mm -hmm. I used to be mods. in that. I have left. Yeah, so was I. And all the mods basically just admitting like, actually, we're monarchists and fascists. And we're just trying to indoctrinate like young libertarians into these ideologies. Well, thanks for letting us know, I guess. Yeah, for real. Um, my, I've suddenly decided that, specifically when, when it comes to people, maybe Hoppeites, I don't know, if, you know, the, the types that we're mostly discussing, not only are they not against other hierarchy, in many cases, they're actually in favor of it. Yeah. They're frequently in favor of religion, sometimes strict religious upbringing, very strict parenting, authoritarian parenting. And parenting is tough to untangle, but you can certainly be a lot worse of a parent, you know, than... I, I think, I think you know, the Hoppeites, the covenant community bullshit, that's, that's what they want. And the sort of obsession with forming a, a community that they can technically call non-coercive, even though that's impossible, mm. that's what they want. They don't want... They're not against hierarchy. They're against yeah. the state. I completely agree with that. And I also think that it's so preposterous to call that a non-coercive society. Like if you mm -hmm. even take a preliminary look at the history of like very closed societies, very highly like religious and hierarchical societies, it is just 
like almost universally rampant with abuse with with like um you know people being uh what uh i lost my words um conversion therapy um you know or even like direct physical violence because of like falling outside of gender norms or falling outside of of um you know religious uh uh you know standards it, it's just not a reality to say that a, that 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 small highly racist highly hierarchical communities can ever be non coercive or even i mean something like the Amish, which I believe has more abuse than we sort of talk about. And we often have a very rosy picture of the Amish, but in some contexts they can be more benign than some of these, you know, things that we're picturing, but it's still an incredible rigidity. Uh, You know, it's, it's, it's educate your kids only until eighth grade. Um, And, you know, I, I, I guess you can choose to not be baptized and then some people will let you come back and visit and some will shun you and sort of by, by nature of parents having religious beliefs and other beliefs, I've kind of become a convert on parents being inherently authoritarian, but I can't say that I know how to resolve that. (laughs) I hear that. (laughs) That's a bit of a doozy. Um, I'll also say that like, I am not, anti-religion and in fact i think Mm -hmm. especially like the history of radical protestantism like the diggers and levelers in england and the quakers and universalists and the u.s are i love those quakers i love the quakers excellent examples of the way that like that like theological arguments against church hierarchy can be extended to society and stuff but the difference is is that it's not just saying oh don't tell us what to do it's more like oh let's be more open let's take the teachings of Jesus seriously that are like, love thy neighbor and accept people as they are. And, you know, even love thy enemy and let's approach it in a way that produces a much more like pluralistic and consensual and, and loving community that doesn't have to, you know, um, uh, resort to violence or, you know, um, exile as a way to keep its integrity. I, I'm against religion, yet I love Quakers, and I have a real soft spot for, you know, Sermon on the Mount, classic Jesus. Mm-hmm. But even, I, I, I think you said Protestant um, traditions, but not a fan of the Catholic Church for some obvious reasons, and also what a bureaucracy, hierarchy, etc. Mm-hmm. But so often when I find out about some cool old, you know, person who's protesting, some you know throwing paint on atomic bombs and like just like someone who's been consistent for 50 years about peace they're always a catholic I mean, yeah not literally but but often so <laughs> it's i, that, I mean um, you look at the catholic workers and dorothy day and like dorothy day i was just reading about her more recently yeah yeah i think there's incredible potential but but i i, I would say like as somebody who is involved in churches from time to time that the 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 basis of a good church is that the people inside the church are willing to challenge the church that it's not a taking everything yeah. into value and being like this is this is the word of god you know um without mistake and the priest or priestess or a minister is the undeniable mouthpiece of god that's when you get serious serious problems because you know if it talk about like a small scale version of the divine right of kings it's if if the, mm-hmm. the if the people who are the mouthpiece of God say something, that's that's it. That's that's the law. But you know, a healthy church involves discourse and challenging hierarchy and challenging different ways to read the Bible and read, or you know, even outside of Christian societies, reading the Torah and 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 reading the mm-hmm. Quran and you know, it's they're fascinating and amazing texts, and it's just you know, like like Marx. You can use them for some pretty messed up stuff. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And they can be used as a replacement for science and hard science and sort exactly. of, you know. Um, I've been wanting to do a whole talk with somebody at some point about Christian anarchism, because I always find that fascinating. Um, Tolstoy and the like. Yeah. 
there's about four, you know, there's about four Christian anarchists. I'm like, I believe you that you are not secretly, you know, alt right, and you would actually <laughs> not. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but okay. But back to the the ANCAP and, and regular anarchist conundrum. A question from the other direction, and this is this is very you know personal experience. When talking to social anarchists, I used to sort of see them as, you know, to to stereotype them like they're sitting around trying to figure out who is the most oppressed, and they're going to talk first in the meeting and sort of, sort of almost like stopping themselves from doing substantial things because they're so sort of stuck in the theory and maybe more so that I feel like I've seen them equivocate between hierarchies um, and sort of say that they're all as bad as the other ones. Whereas I'm still stuck on the state is the worst, Mm. but to me, the state is the worst, but that doesn't end the conversation. You know, okay, yeah, people who are on states' rights, which is not a real thing, Mm -hmm. are like, well, you can move, you know, states easier than you can move countries. Absolutely. But that doesn't end the conversation, right? You're talking about a a harm reduction thing, like what has enough power to harm? And a federal state has, you know, the widest reach, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess what it comes down to for me is that the state is... I see as the most inex- inescapable hierarchy and with, with the least amount of room for, you know, maybe you have a really nice family and your parents are very open and they, you know, they tell you why instead of because they said so and stuff hmm. simply because there's no room for a state that's not coercive. To me, that kind of means the state is the worst one, but I don't know if that, that might be a little shallow. I don't know. I hear that. And I, affirm it because like i totally was saying that like the state is the most obvious like because it's the one with the guns and it's the one with the police officers and but i think it's also important to look at what why the state does what it does and Mm -hmm. i think that that's something that marx can really help us with even though it's not exclusive to marx but that you know a, a Going back to historical materialism a little bit, one of the things that really differentiates Marx and particularly like younger Marx from Engels and the Marxist Leninists and things like that is like no shying away from the fact that the way the economic structures that currently exist in our society are reinforced by the state and that it's it's not some incidental shift in economic in like a predetermined history of the world that led to capitalism or feudalism, but like it's real human violence, you know, as a way to reorganize the means of production as a way to affect the relations of production. Um, and because the state is fundamentally a class instrument, you know, Lenin will tell you that Albert J. Nock will tell you that, um, it's the role that the state plays. The reason the role does what it does is essentially to, to, um, continue the interests of a small group of owners and because you know it lets you know in a theoretical agricultural society if everyone's just growing you know food and then giving it to each other or trading with each other the there's no issue but then if one person doesn't want to have to work but but wants to get the profit from these the the farms what better way than by convincing a bunch of people to get a bunch of big sticks and beating each beating them over the head and taking it as taxes and as 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 mm-hmm. in 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 certain economic relationships of like wage laborer and capitalist, um, so I I hear that and I I totally agree with the state being the most outright, but I think it it, it it's it's much more of a situation where all these hierarchies are just feeding into each other and have particularly have an economic basis about mm-hmm. making sure that a that a large group of people have to work for the profit of a small group of people. Yeah, I mean, God knows they feed into each other. And even, you know, even your ANCAPs will usually sort of admit that to a point. Um, yeah. I guess, you know, I still imagine like, um, again, it's an all, it's a libertarian sort of mainstream libertarian question. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, a sweatshop, for example, 
and the question being compared to what like how bad is the situation okay it's not great here in the sweatshop but compared to what you know people moved to the cities in the industrial revolution to work in places that we find totally heinous because farming's not great right mm -hmm. so i yeah. mean I, I still see that there's more room, there's more wiggle room within um, an economic exchange, provided you're not a literal slave, than there is with the state, even if it's far from ideal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I think that the really important thing that people miss about the Marxist critique of capitalism is not that everything that exists under capitalism is fundamentally bad and should be destroyed and abolished because it's undeniable that like even alongside like environmental degradation and these new hierarchy mm -hmm. stuff like the opening of markets um allowed women to leave the household and it was a totally a way for um you know and and think about all the amazing technology that capitalism has produced like we live at a, as at you know at least um in the global north uh, at a um, or even globally at a standard that was that is unimaginable to somebody you know living in in the feudal era but at the same time it's a deeper question of okay we have all this great stuff but who gets to control that who gets to make those the decisions about how those things are allocated and and how what kind of values are produced like and I that's why I think that that um, you know, part of the historical materialist argument that I'm going for is that le market anarchism should position itself alongside this sort of broader argument that that among you know young socialists these days that it's like yeah this is great but p the the people who actually do the work need to be the ones making the decisions and 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 then you know and that's really for me the way that we can start talking about like. Um, you know, workers getting the means of production is, you know, uh, that I just don't see a situation in which we can have anything like a nominal free, like a, like a free market, um, without first establishing some kind of autonomy from the, 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 the violence and the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, class centric, not class centric, the capitalist class centric, um, economy. And the only way that I really see that, and this is what I think differentiates me from a lot of market anarchists, is like market anarchists for the most part want to socialize access to capital. So like opening up markets and 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 mutual banking and having commons that can lead to a greater equalization and access to capital. But I really feel that in a situation like this, and I even was rereading some stuff from Tucker about how disillusioned he felt about the way that wealth concentration had gone that he even didn't even think that free banking could truly affect that that oh crap we're in such a like a crap situation that we need to all work together to get the um production into the hands of of the many of the communities of the of the of factory workers to negotiate among themselves which i think will necessarily involve some kind of market relationship if it's going to be successful because you know you know, like, uh, and for producers to negotiate amongst themselves. And, um, you know, and I, so I, I want autonomy. And I think autonomy mm -hmm. is what we need for something like free banking, mutual banking, community currencies to flourish. This is a much smaller point compared to all of that, but... <laughs> I am reminded both of the time I sat through an Occupy DC meeting and the time I saw William Gillis give a speech. And the Occupy DC meeting was very endearingly full of, you know, uh, consensus and things like that. It was also pretty tedious. Mm -hmm. And um, in the very long William Gillis speech, I remember him talking about sort of his contrast to, I don't know if it was barter systems or more of a reputation um, Oh gosh, what's that term? You know, he's talking about like some people want to just be able to exchange X for Y and call it a day. And sort of I'm reminded of that when you're talking about a factory. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who want to be involved in the running of said factory. But I think there's maybe more people than we might think who would like to have a steady 
you know, quote unquote, unskilled labor job or something that doesn't involve planning and coordinating. And they would be okay with that. And they would be maybe prefer that. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, some, some I hear people kind of want to just be able to live without having to be part of the grand um, consensus and planning and coordinating, I think. For sure. And I turn off their brain at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think for me, it's fundamentally about the choice to do that. <laughs> uh, I think that I, I completely hear that. And actually, if I'm being perfectly honest, I think that I might be end up being one of those people. If we succeed in creating a you know, I'm on the fence, but yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I kind of want to do my own stuff. But I think it's really about like the fact that we live in a an economy dominated by, um, you know, these monopolies and all these things. But even just on a, a, a level of looking at labor, like the way that it's so difficult to get access to capital because of, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the banking monopoly and um, you know, difficulty of financing structures and stuff that um, – even if people want to, you know, let's start a co-op, it's so difficult to do that. It's so difficult to, um, and then compete against corporations that have like, get literally get m- millions and millions and millions of dollars um, by tax refund or just directly through subsidies. Like the, 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 there's no balance there at all. It's, and so, you know, for me, I want sort of a, I do have this sort of Marxist dream of the workers, you know, taking control of the means of production and stuff. But at the same time, for me, that's a means to, okay, well, let's, what's a situation in which you can choose more fundamentally if you want to be part of this democratic decision making, or do you just want to be a contractual worker for your local factory cooperative? You know, like that's fine. I, the difference between me and a Marxist is that, I have no, I'm not enamored by planning at all. I am not enamored. Okay, by, good. <laughs> I, I am not enamored by communist, um, like a communist economy. What I am enamored by is people having cooperative control over their lives. Well, we haven't really talked about Lawrence Labadi. I wanted to be all French before. I call him <laughs> Lawrence Labadé or something. Lawrence but... Labadé. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about him. You were involved in an archival project of his work. Yes. So let me first clarify. How come? <laughs> yeah. That I am not sure entirely how to pronounce his last name. And I'm in a very noble tradition there because people in the in documents like misspell his name or they like um they call him Larry and then other people are like nobody <laughs> called him Larry. Um <laughs> And so I sort of came about it. Debate. I know, right? Is what Larry, literally one of the biographies of him is called, We Never Called Him Larry. Um, <laughs> but I, there are analog recordings of him somewhere that I think he might say his name on, but I am still in the process of trying to track those down. But yeah, we're going to so go. Who with, was Larry? <laughs> who was Larry? Larry Tell was me, I mean, what, sort of what's the. <laughs> Larry was born in Detroit. Um, to Joseph and Sophie Labadi, Labadi. Joseph Labadi being one, a famous labor organizer and an associate of Benjamin Tucker and his periodical mm-hmm. liberty. And so Lawrence, Larry got involved with uh, the labor movement pretty early on, lots of associations with socialist political organizations in Detroit. He worked as a machinist. Um, but by the 1930s, he very much took a turn towards the more sterner influenced individualism of Tucker as opposed to the more like labor centric labor union stuff of his dad. And then by the 1940s, he became involved with Ralph Borsati and his school of living, which was sort of the back, back to the land movement in the forties. Um, okay. And eventually you know, he we would, had those in the 40s, really. yeah, it was, it was, it's an interesting phenomenon. Unfortunately in Germany, the back to the land movement basically laid the groundwork for Nazism, but in the U S it was a little like, intense like that. But Either way, he would eventually move um, and live on a homestead um, himself. Um, and uh, up into the 70s, he would uh, contribute to a lot of journals and periodicals. And it's really interesting, as like I said before, watching him uh, in the 60s and 70s debating Rothbard and debating Rand and debating like 
whether it's directly like I let's talk to each other or just like a commentary and him being very appalled that even though he's like this firm individual as he is, he really has no sympathy for communism at all. And is very much about the free market, mm-hmm. very much about individualism, but he's like, Holy crap, this is a total corruption of everything my father and Tucker ever, ever wanted or ever tried to argue about. And specifically by the of- Rand or just because there's like eight different Murray Rothbards, and I'm never sure which one someone's debating, you know, because he made such. I guess what was what was the great corruption with them? Um, for him, him, it had a lot to do with acceptance of economic relationships that he considered exploitative. So, apologism for rent, for even interest and profit, but not profit in the sense of just making money, but in of extracting wealth or value from somebody else's work and that for those Mm -hmm. to be like the predominant feature of a free market economy was just totally off the wall for him even though that's become very much like a canon today of of course those are normal relationships that would exist in a free market system um and he sees not only the pro-capitalist libertarians coming along but he also is just watching like the Soviet Union come together and then, and he's watching the, the horrible things that the U S has done. And by the end of his life, he was pretty much disillusioned with anarchism, not because he thought it was okay. or pa- practically wrong, but you know, there's this um, great interview with him in that I have in the archi- archive where he's basically just like wealth equality, property concentration, straight power. It just becomes so great that anarchism is just not really possible anymore. And it's from this sort of fear of that that I'm sort of making Mm -hmm. this call of like, shit, well, let's finally work together because shit's getting pretty bad. Um, But what is it about him in particular that strikes you enough that you're, you know, working on his archive and stuff? Is it just that challenge, the pessimistic challenge or, um, you know? It's a little bit because even though I, I, it's so funny because I like to think of myself as a pessimist, but everyone I've ever met is like, you're an incorrigible. Um, what I what I think makes Labadi so unique is, and re- relevant for left-wing market anarchists today is just that he lives in this very interesting period of history where he's born in 1898. And his father didn't really try to indoctrinate him into anarchism. He came to that really by himself, especially because he had access to his father and to Tucker and the individualist circles. Um, But by the time he hit his stride in the 1930s, most of the North American individualists and mutualists were dying off. Um, So it was, he kind of took it up to himself as being like the defender of their legacy. People call him the, uh, I, the last of the individualists, the heir of Warren, the keeper of the flame. And, but he lived up until the 1970s and he's not only interacting with, uh, with, with Rothbard, but it's in that very era that free market economics took a turn towards anti-capitalism again, that he doesn't really acknowledge it as much, but this is the time period you get Carl Hess and Samuel Edward Konkin, agorism and um, this like new left libertarian, um, ideas and left-wing market anarchism today draws from many sources but the the core too at least in my opinion are these 19th century individualists and the libertarian new left alliance in the 60s and Labadi connects both of them and also allows us to make sort of a historical claim about the continuity of you know radical anti-capitalist libertarianism that it's not just some aberration that appears in the 20th century on the internet but it's it starts with Proudhon and Warren, and then it's Benjamin Tucker and his cohorts, and then Labadi, and then Hess and Konkin, and then Carson and Long, and this major reoccurrence we're seeing on the internet. Um, and also just like that we, you know, we aren't just a um, a weird bastard offshoot of libertarianism. Uh, we are part of the great body of socialists, as Tucker put it, and anti-capitalists and things like that, and that we... we yeah, we are. We have our own history unto ourselves. I recently tried to write something that I don't think really came across, besides to myself, about Spooner and his essay on against women's suffrage, which it's literally called that, which I think is sort of a delightful troll. 
<laughs> because the entire piece is actually just about how women are equal to men, but voting is stupid and bad and coercive. Um, yeah, which is kind of... Emma- but it had a lot more... I'm sorry? Hmm? Which is kind of Emma Goldman's point, too. I guess it's a way of trying to ask about the, the, the darker side of, you know, and caps, but not even necessarily just them where it can slip a distrust of democracy and sort of the, you know, the Democrat liberal mainstream way can slide extraordinarily fast into fasc- apologism for fascism. Mm-hmm. So when I see Spooner being very sort of clear and direct saying that, you know, these suffragettes should go rip up, the laws and then that would be great. But you know, they are in fact the same as men. They're as as equal. Mm -hmm. And the internet's a lot more full of, you know, Peter Thiel types. Um, I think literally he did this saying, ha ha, the 19th amendment was a mistake. Um, I remember that. And I don't know if you've ever encountered sort of this clash between no, no democracy doesn't make morality and boy, you guys like fascism and monarchy. Mm. I mean, it's not that, you know, it shouldn't be that hard, but I've encountered this quite a bit, I feel like. Yeah, I think the way I look at it is that the critique of democracy is democracy in a certain sense, that it's democracy mm. as in, like, I find it very difficult to believe that that most anarchists who are against democracy are against just like, hey, if we're going to make a quick decision raise your hand if you want to make this collective decision. And there's much more of a complex critique of like the way that democracy with a state comes to um, utilize itself to basically make it out to be as if the people voting have an actual say. So like if the government makes some sort of unilateral decision, they can be like, it's the will of the people. And it's like, that's not even really how that works. But I think that democracy right. is very much a tool. It's a tool just like markets are a tool to exchange things. It's a Democracy is a tool to make decisions with. Um, it can be very effective. It can sometimes be really tyrannical and irritating. Um, and I think that to take the view of um, the critique of democracy from these sort of anarchists is as being like something in favor of fascism or of like – monarchism or anything like that is really preposterous and actually happened in the in the lifetime of Tucker himself um who there was a group called this the Cercle Proudhon which was a French nationalist group that basically said oh well Proudhon didn't like the government and democracy so we'll just get together all the people who hated democracy so the monarchists and the er, 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 the aristocrats and the no the people and we'll use these very like nitpicked um you know versions of Proudhon to justify it. And Tucker is looking at that and he writes about it and he's like, what the fuck? That's not, that's not at all what that was meant to be used as. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's not only preposterous, but it's also something that has just been going on since the, like the, the 19th century, this constant struggle. I guess I shouldn't of, be surprised. Yeah. It's, that was, yeah. you know, nothing new under the sun. It's just that now that we have the internet, it's a lot louder and a lot more easily accessible. When I first heard someone paraphrase, um, sort of the, the democracy God that failed concept, the Hoppe book mm. to me, it seemed like an interesting thought experiment. Mostly the idea that somehow a democracy the legitimacy of the state is sort of within us all. And it seemed kind of vaguely profound at the time Mm -hmm. until I realized how many people were literally in favor of monarchy instead. Yeah. And, um, you know, or, or turn into fascists very easily. And you describing as a tool I like, because I think a tool looking at certain tactics as a tool, it can maybe help, you know, keep the reactionary slide from getting you you know if um Mm -hmm. if barack obama protects uh the dreamers from deportation that doesn't mean that executive orders are anarchist or the ideal but it was a tool that was used to stop a type of coercion you know Mm -hmm. i feel like the need to be consistent on these tools is sort of i don't know you know if democracy leads to human liberty then good, we had more human liberty, but 
I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it totally makes sense. And that's kind of my argument about how we might work with, with Marxists is to use historical materialism as a tool, as a model, to way to look at reality, to create a cross-pollinating analysis. And then also to, you know, you talk about the, the executive orders and stuff, but I think on a, even more on a local level, we can start look one way to look at the state is as, you know, what it is, which is a massive and deeply inefficient organization that is just so large that it suffers from communication problems, from collective action problems, from the dangers of distributed knowledge. And so it can be like twisted and warped to our advantage sometimes, especially on a, mm-hmm. on a local level, which is where the sort of thing that I see a role for like democratic socialists to maybe uh, help us out. Like, you know, if it's whether it's it's you know let's give tax breaks to transferring ownership to workers or let's turn a monopolistic power utility into a community cooperative or let's grant squatters greater rights like there's there's ways for us to impact in a much more patchworked way than like a there's this revolution that's going to change everything and everything's going to be right. flipped on its head and because that's not how change works change is a bunch of quantitative change accumulated into qualitative change and so I think. You know, and I think that that's not inconsistent with with um, anarchism in that lot. The state is sometimes a tool. Proudhon wanted a national people's bank. Rothbard in, uh, talks about in what are the specifics. You know, um, and you know, mention of Rothbard as like a state abolitionist libertarian as opposed to a anarchist, but saw nationalism as like potentially a means for giving workers uh, the industries uh, that they worked in if they were state funded industries or. Kevin Carson has a lot on libertarian municipalism. Like there's there, I don't even think I, I go as far as some of these thinkers in basically just saying like, there's some really on the ground immediate ways that we can use all kinds of tools, whether it's the government, mm-hmm. democratic decision-making communism of, you know, from, from each according to their ability to each according to their need, like the markets, these are tools we can use to increase what is a much more profound goal of human autonomy, freedom, flourishing, you know. There's nothing wrong with voluntary communism. Good yeah, luck. You know, good luck. <laughs> with I, however that works out. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I live on a commune. I really do. And do you? I do. And it's very communist. I should have prodded you about that more. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much information I give. I'm a little off the grid. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll... <laughs> Yeah, that's that's maybe someday we we can talk about that more, even if it's in a cagey fashion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and this is the problem with people who are interesting. I want to take things in a million different directions. Um, I kind of just briefly, I'm curious about again, you know, the, through a right wing lens, the idea of national divorce or you know secession, if you want to take it back. Um, or microstates, like there's a lot of versions of that, and most of them make me my skin crawl a little bit. Um, you know, localism is great, but the way it's framed and the way that I fear it would turn out, besides you know probably a bunch of bloodshed, I don't know. I find it very unappealing, but I'm not quite sure why. I guess you know. I mean, I mean the government, the, the 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 state is too big, right? The United States is humongous, if nothing else. Well, let's not beat around the bush. Localism is absolutely can be a means for greater oppression. It's, it's, you know, mm-hmm. you mentioned states' rights earlier, like the argument for there's, I don't know, it, it's profoundly strange to me that there's an argument, libertarian argument for states' rights where it's like, oh, well, we're okay with state oppression as long as it's on a lower scale, like as long as it's on a more distributed scale. And I'm like, what? It's so odd. But for me... And this is also my approach for, uh, you know, whether it's right libertarians or Marxist Leninists is if you're more interested in state building, whether it's a top down worker state or right wing secessionism, which is state building, it's about establishing a new government that can that can fuck over more people. If that's your 100 (laughs) percent thing, I don't have time for you. I don't have time to work with you. That's like that's the big thing is I even though I have all this 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 empathy towards um, Marxism and Marxist analysis stuff is I have like almost no time for anybody who's like, let's build a worker state. It's like, no, let's work right here, right now 
on pushing towards autonomy and worker power and, you know, uh, you know, cooperative ownership and greater control for people over their lives. Let's, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, and so localism as a means of like, say, um, you know, getting more cooperative ownership is something you can use local government for, but I am totally unenamored with the more like communalist look where it's like, well, we can just make the local government this like beautiful, like democracy that everyone is involved in. And, um, you know, it's, it, it will be benevolent and it's like, but government is not benevolent. Government on no level is benevolent. Whether or not it can be used to produce beneficial results says nothing about whether it is a benevolent thing and should exist. Absolutely. I like that. <laughs> now, with all that and your essay, have you found opportunity to work with, you know, quasi-right-wing people or ANCAPs at all? I mean... I would never say it's impossible either as much as I'm a recent, you know, I'm mad at them mm -hmm. for being terrible. Um, but I mean, does it like Roderick Long, you, you quote in your essay is a little more charitable towards um, ANCAPism than I actually realized he was, which is interesting. And, and Roderick Long, Long is very cool. So yeah. has it ever come up to work with people along those lines? I hear a lot of Marxists working with, but honestly, not really. And here's yeah. the reason why, I think, is because so much of the libertarian critique, the right libertarian critique, is rhetorical as opposed to, like, practical in the sense, with maybe the exception, actually, I wouldn't even say that, because agorism is not a right-wing ideology. Agorism is firmly left-wing, in my opinion. But lots of anarcho-capitalists... I was definitely going to ask about that next. Yes, we can talk about it. <laughs> Um, Anarcho-capitalism uses agor ancaps use agorism, but other than that, there's really no praxis. It's people will be like, I'm like talking to right libertarians, and they're like, well, the state is bad. I'm like, yes, taxation is bad, yes, and blah 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 blah. And I'm like, well, what are we going to do about it? And they're like, avoid the state. Whereas Marxists, for all the their discontents, um, at least uh, with the exception of Marxist Leninists, sometimes mm -hmm. it's. I have some Leninist friends who are actually useful, but I'm convinced they're not actually Leninists. They just use the term Leninist. But anyway, Marxists are much more, and socialists and syndicalists, and you know, not even to just contain it to one category, are so much more about like, what's the on the ground stuff we can do right now? Like, how are we yeah, helping- to, that checks out. Yeah, how are we helping to get people food they need? How are we helping create? Because one of the ways that I think we can um, truly- you know, reduce state power is by getting people what they need without the state, which is agorism, basically, mm -hmm. that let's build mutual aid, let's build cooperatives, let's build land trusts, let's build community currencies. These are things that are like real material things that we can do on the ground to improve people's lives. And I just don't see ANCAPs doing that. If they started doing it, I might be way more like open to calling them anarchists, um, but I just don't see it. I mean, would we want them to, I suppose, is another question, because, yeah. you know, so the worst the worst of them, we wouldn't want them to. Maybe that's just like Charlottesville yeah. stuff. But, I mean, you can get really bogged down in the right to be a selfish jerk, and I'm in favor of that right. Oh, yeah. But ANCAPs are downright, you know, they're proactively jerks a lot of the time, you know? And I just, um, like, the particularly... And this is, again, the Marxist in me that I just don't think that the world changes on the basis of ideas. The world changes okay. on the basis of material realities, how we exchange, how we produce, how we consume. Those are the ways that truly fundamentally alter our realities. And I, the ideas have a role in that. Like, I'm not saying no ideas, head empty, no thoughts, um, but that ideas separate from that kind of reality are just ideas. And that's the problem in my yeah. mind of anarcho-capitalism is it's so much just ideas. And some of those aren't even any good. <laughs> no, some of them are pretty Um, cool. well, you're, I was, um, 
the overuse of the word materialism from Marxists is also something where I'm like, you're being redundant sometimes, but you, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm getting it more now. Like, okay. I think you're using it in a defter manner. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, any philosophical idea used as a bludgeoning tool is going to be useless and annoying and destructive. Or just even a code sort of for, you know, though, if you know, you know, yeah. and it's not a very useful way of speaking, I think, a lot of the time. And we all do that, obviously, but For sure. I don't know why I've enjoyed picking on Marxists in a very sort of, you know, I'm not that committed to picking on them, but I, I mean, don't know. Fair enough. I think Michael <laughs> Hart, um, who wrote a couple of really good books with Antonio Negri, who's also a really great Marxist, who everyone should read, but his argument is basically that materialism is so much less about, like, a adherence to the fact that the world is made of matter or that, you know, economic conditions create the world, but much more about just deprioritizing the human mind and being much more conscious of all the non-human or like, you know, extra human forces that can, that impact our lives and are like real definers of the way we live our realities and so not thinking that the world changes on the basis of changing your ideas, changing yourself, like the self-help kind of stuff, but is much more about let's change reality. Mm -hmm. It's the best sell I've heard about. From <laughs> oh. um, uh, I lo you know, I lost our nice tidy segue, but agorism, I mean, you live on a commune. Is I there do any agorism that. going on over there? I can't tell you that. <laughs> I, cool. I, cool. I like it. Okay. Means yes, but also no. Um, but <laughs> let's talk about it more theoretically because counter economic. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I learned about it, oddly enough, in context of the Free State Project, which is another nice sounding libertarian thing to me that went awry and has bred some you know, reactionary right-wing type of instincts and stuff. But so I've almost begun to associate agorism in a right-wing way, which as you said before, you disagree with that. So we could start there. Yeah. Well, I think that agorism taken out of its context in, hmm, how do I put this? I am, hmm. Give me a sec, sec to <laughs> gather my thoughts. Um, agorism is kind of politically neutral in terms of the actual praxis of it. That it's very that makes sense. That Absolutely, it, it is very much like you know we want a society that is not based on nonviolent market exchange um, without state intervention. So let, to do that, let's just do nonviolent market exchange and state intervention, and anybody can do it. You know, anybody can be an agorist, but at the same time, I think agorism falls short if you miss that Konkin places it in a much more, a much better context of the way in which capitalism is the problem that agorism is trying to resist. That capitalism is not the natural processes of, of reality or, you know, the free market, but is, is, a, is the rule by owners of capital. And how do the owners of capital get capital? Almost exclusively through some kind of state intervention, whether it's on a smaller scale of who gets a bank loan or on a bigger scale, like I literally stole this land from the local native tribe. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you look at agorism that way, it's much more a critique of hierarchy in, in that sort of anarchist sense that it's like, you know, so much of the problems that we encounter in our lives um, and so many of the hierarchies we encounter in our lives have to do with direct or structural violence and that a real praxis that intends to s both ignore and s like, you know, subvert those, that violence will necessarily have to challenge deeper hierarchies, which is why Konkin is like a fan of the industrial workers of the world and is, has a class theory in and of himself, which I think is, you know, here or there, but it's still pretty interesting. And so even as anyone can do agorism, 
like that's the great thing about agorism. I think agorism as like a as like a tool to reach a more you know benevolent society or however you want to put it. It, it needs to have that finer grained critique. I mean, maybe it's not political at all. I mean, I guess you, you said that. Um, I mean, what's the difference between agorism and the just the inevitability of any kind of black market? You know, the just the simple fact that, you know, if you ban something, it's not going to disappear. Is that just the inevitability of a market? Um, I don't know. Is yeah. that agorism? I think so. I mean, I, I think that I would call that more the counter economy or counter economics, I guess. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, and I don't know how much this holds up, but agorism sort of has an intention to it because agorism, the goal of agorism is the agora to have a space of nonviolent exchange that eventually challenges and replaces the state. And right. You can do counter economics. You can trade on the black market and the gray market or do, you know, off the book services and things like that without the, that broader goal, without any sort of sense of, oh, I want a more nonviolent society. And that doesn't detract at all from the fact you're doing counter economics. But I'm not sure that speaks to the richness of what agorism is in terms of like, not just Konkin, but like the great elaborations that have been done on his work, especially by my colleague, Logan Glitterbaum, who writes a bunch on mm -hmm. agorism and it's just great, great stuff um, that has that sort of fine grained critique. I guess I, I still want to go back to like, I feel like almost no person besides the nine people at C4SS and over here at non-Servium we like, you know, like markets, markets have such a sullied reputation and obviously agorism is a market. Um, and that means you can, you know, be less cutthroat, obviously, or you can, but a market is a market. And I just, I'm just mad at capitalism for making them look bad, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And for making them so like boring and awful that, <laughs> you know, because you think about the incredible ways and variety of ways that human beings have exchanged with each other over our, our history. And it's just like, it's incredible. And it's, it's really been one of my main academic interests is just exchange and the histories of exchange and things like that. And the fact that we live in a world now where there's basically one kind of exchange that has come to rule all other kinds of exchanges. And it's through state produced currency that is like easily regulated right. and stuff like, and is constantly, you know, crashing and being messed up and producing these shitty relationships and not getting people the capital they need to create things like markets have such this incredible ability when left to do their own thing which is really just means letting people do their own thing to produce like a multiplicity of all these incredible, uh, you know, relationships you can have with other people. And it just really bothers me. One of my core critiques of capitalism is that it's just like, it's so monocultural. It's so about just yeah. like creating. And that has so much to do with like making it units legible for the state so they can tax you so they can turn you into a statistic. Like, but it's, it's just made the ways in which we exchange at best boring, at worst exploitative. I, uh, I feel like someday we'll have to wrap up, but now I just want to start asking you about cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> because I feel like that's another thing that's been tinged with a very right-wing association. I mean, you mentioned free banking and even, oh gosh, was it mutual banking? Something I haven't even really, I'm not really aware of. Um, but a market in currencies sounds good. So do you have any connection to crypto stuff? Do you have any strong feelings about it? I wrote a piece that was very hard on crypto. It's called okay. Why Crypto Won't Save Us from the Capitalist Workplace. Um, I have issues with it. I think 
it in theory versus it in practice are two very different things, particularly because of the ways that, you know, crypto has become a sort of situation where it's all about getting in there first and and getting as right. much as possible and creating these sort of dynamics where there's like a 1% in terms of crypto ownership. But, and also, you know, it uses a lot of energy. It's, it's um, right. all the blah, 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 blah. But like, I am not against people using crypto at all. And I think there's totally a place for it, especially in, you know, this, our, our ideal, you know, future stateless market society as a means to exchange between in relationships that aren't based on trust. But I think mm -hmm. that a lot of times cryptocurrency detracts from the many, many, many other kinds of community currencies and alternative currencies that um, exist and are constantly emerging, like local exchange trade systems and time banking and, um, uh, uh, you know, just like local barter systems and things like that, where that it's not just about exchange, but also about generating communities of exchange that are like on the same level, like, you know, uh, like a town will use a time bank and create this sort of relationship where they're able to exchange with each other without it being taxed or regulated, but that it doesn't have, it like almost inherently doesn't lead to this dynamic where like, like a couple people own all of it because they happen to get in first. So, you know, my preference would be that we focus on these sort of like community currencies. And I think those will be really the basis of like what people fall back on in when the inevitably the next economic bust happens, which is what happened during the Great Depression. Like you, there's one estimate that says like a billion dollars worth of community currencies were produced during the Great Depression as like a way to exchange without, because the, you know, money was worth it. Yeah, it's really yeah. interesting stuff. And that, you know, in the long run, crypto could totally be a great way for communities that don't have trust relationships to, to you know, exchange. But I think it's much more important that we build these sort of on the ground, like alternatives, as opposed to something that is also becoming so quickly, just like, I don't know if commodified is the right word, but just like taken over by shitty people. Like, <laughs> a bit, yeah. yeah, like, you know, I, I don't shy away from using cryptocurrency, but it's not my priority. And I have some critiques of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the you know, the trust that that being the ideal makes sense. But I imagine it'll be it'll be a long time before no one will need a more secure and secretive type of you know, for sure, uh, financial interaction. It's gonna be a long time before we get to that. For sure. I really want to time banking. <laughs> didn't we miss that? <laughs> you you're gonna. Um, have I don't know if you. <laughs> Um, maybe that's, you know, the sequel is we'll have to talk about time banking, I guess, yeah. and, and other things. We can have a whole talk about currency, for God's sake. I love, I, currency is a, a, a passion of mine. <laughs> yeah, there's so much there that only sort of, um, you know, so much of the left has no sort of curiosity and awareness of the diversity of that. They really think money greedy capitalists and yeah. they don't yeah they don't i don't know i wish they knew about yeah. some of the uh potential for sure i mean but yeah no <laughs> um so many tangents i want to do we have a tradition um that i usually remember at non-servium which is the question of how will i get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia and it's me because in case you don't like cappuccino, that's a way to get it. I want that cappuccino. How mm. will I get it in your utopia? Gotcha. Um, I tend to shy away from utopias, but I will say that if my speculations about the world pan out, uh, you would hopefully get a cappuccino at a worker owned coffee shop on a street that's owned and operated by a voluntary association of homes and stores. And, Maybe you pay for it with time dollars or you pay it with one of the many concurrent currencies or maybe you pay it with crypto if you're in the town that you haven't been before and you need a cappuccino. And 
The coffee beans are acquired through a supply chain that's like cooperative and unimpeded by borders or regulations from farmers that own their land individually or cooperatively. Uh, maybe the cappuccino is is uh, the cup is made from um, like a local recycling cooperative that takes excess paper and turn, repurposes it. And maybe the coffee shop was built by a worker owned construction business. It's kind of these like endless things, but that's sort of my, my idea of how it all would work out. I've, I've heard worse. That sounds, that sounds pretty <laughs> solid. Um, coffee will have to be shade grown, check the birds. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot of things. To For sure. That, For I sure. Think. As long as I get that coffee. Um, I feel like we should wrap up, if nothing else, for the sake of the poor editor who will edit this. But I would love to have you on again sometime, if you'd be willing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been great chatting. Now, where can the good people listening find you on the internet? Um, or, you know, point them point them somewhere. I would say Center for Stateless Society. I'm pretty low-key in terms of my social media. I'm pretty off the grid, but... If you want to find my writing, it's it's Eric Fleischman, Center for Stateless Society. You can also listen to me ramble um, on, on my podcast, which is the En Rangé, which I picked up after the wonderful Joel Williamson. Um, and uh, we talk about Center for Stateless Society articles and elaborate on articles and stuff. And yeah, um, that's pretty much where you can find me. People can find me as usual still on the slowly dying Twitter. L U C Y S T A G Lucy Stag. Um, I'm over on Mastodon. I'm on Substack more, so who knows? But you can find me there if you like. I'll try to write more and tweet less. Um, but Eric, this has been a pleasure, and I hope to talk to you again. Thank you very much for coming on the On Serbian Podcast. Fantastic. Thank you so much. listening to the non-Serbian podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.